the book of Acts in the Bible is the record of what happened after Jesus died, rose from death, and went back to heaven. We've titled this series, To Be Continued, words that you've probably seen at the end of a TV episode or at the end of a two-part film. I've shown you, I'm sure you've seen these words and felt frustration. You really want to see the second part now. How does Vera solve the crime? Can the Avengers recover after Thanos' finger snap? Will the captured Han Solo survive? The words to be continued fill us with frustration. So why do directors use them? The words to be continued are used to build anticipation. There is a second part. This is not the end. The words to be continued are an invitation. An invitation to book your seat on the sofa or the cinema ready to experience part two. The words to be continued are sometimes used to encourage participation. For example, the director of Dune Part 1 ended the film to be continued in the hope that the audience would pressurise Warner Brothers to fund Part 2. For only if the audience participated, buying tickets, creating demand, would Dune Part 2 actually happen. Anticipation, invitation, participation. Keep these three words in mind as we work our way through Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them convin conv convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So firstly, anticipation. The book of Acts is part two of Luke's two-part series called Luke and Acts. In part two, Luke, the author, wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And wouldn't it be frustrating if that was the end of the story. For Jesus was someone who brought hope to the hopeless. And in case you haven't realised, there is a massive need for hope today. Think back to the latest fuel crisis. You, rem you might remember that there was a lack of fuel, and so everyone set off on a mission trying to buy some. People were so desperate that a tanker carrying mortar was followed by over 20 drivers because they hoped it contained petrol. It reminded me that people will follow anything, even empty things, when something is in short supply. And right now people, including me, are following anything and everything because hope is in short supply. You can't get an appointment with a GP because we're desperate for treatments to save us from sickness and death. Millions are subscribed to Tinder, a dating app, because we're all desperate for someone to share life with. Somebody, anybody, who will show us value and love. Bookshops are full of books about self-help, mindfulness and meditation because we're all looking for something to help us cope better with life. MPs are inundated with letters from people asking for justice because they're part of an overlooked minority or they've been treated unfairly and nothing's been done. Holland and Barrett, 
They have bottled every vitamin, mineral and ingredient on the planet. They've made a business of selling them to us because everyone is on the lookout for a magic potion to help them feel 21 again. Now the Bible doesn't condemn any of us for being on the search for hope. And many of the things that I've mentioned sometimes provide hope in a temporary and partial way. But the good news is that these verses point us to the place where lasting hope can be found. Luke says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth and brought hope to the hopeless, both through what he said and through what he did. Jesus' healings radically changed people's life circumstances. Jesus raised the dead and spoke about the promises of eternal life. Jesus told the guilt-ridden that they could be forgiven. Jesus spoke about the time when God would bring about perfect justice. Jesus drew alongside people, including outcasts, and showed them the compassion of God in tangible ways. Wouldn't it be frustrating if that's where the story ended? Wouldn't it be devastating if such a hope was only available to the people back then? But the good news is, the good that Luke opens his second book, part two, with the theme, to be continued. This is not the end. There is a part two. Jesus still offering people hope today. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, this second book is about all that Jesus continued to do, all that Jesus continued to teach. Jesus is still doing. Jesus is still speaking. Jesus is still in the business of changing lives today. We'll see this as we go through the book of Acts as a church. In chapter 2, we'll see Jesus calling people to himself as the gospel is announced. In chapter 8, we'll see that Jesus is still listening to people's prayers for forgiveness. In chapter 9, we'll see Jesus show up to change people's lives radically. In chapter 11, we'll see Jesus working with and through the disciples in the most challenging of situations. In chapter 14, we'll see Jesus show up and confirm that the message about him is not some fairy tale. In chapter 16, we'll see Jesus open people's hearts to the gospel message. In every chapter, from 1 to 28, we see that Jesus is alive. Jesus is still at work. Jesus is still in the business of changing people's lives today. Now, why might this be relevant to you? Well, as we thought about before, we are all on the search for hope some teaching to help us cope with life, someone in whom we can find acceptance and love, some person whose promises can actually be believed. If you can relate to any of these longings, Jesus is the place to begin. But what about if you've already began this journey? What about if you already began trusting Jesus for yourself? Well, let me ask you a simple question. Do you believe Jesus is alive? If you answered yes, here is another question. Do you really believe Jesus is alive? I don't mean do you believe Jesus rose from death. I mean, is the risen Jesus still at work in the world today? Is still Jesus, is, sorry, is Jesus still working through his people? no matter how weak and unimpressive? Is Jesus still calling people to himself, even in a country that has largely shut its ears? Is Jesus able to change people's lives, or will people be disappointed if they pursue him? The book of Acts is there to whet our anticipation. Jesus continues to be at work, and one way he continues to be at work is through the words and actions of his people, the church. 
through the words and the actions of you and me. Jesus can speak into people's hearts as we speak to them about him. Jesus can work in people's lives as we go about doing the work that he left us on earth to do. As it says in verse 8, Jesus said, You will receive power from when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This isn't simply a command. This is a promise. This is a promise. Jesus is promising us, his Holy Spirit, to help us continue his work. Which brings us to the next part, invitation. I'll begin by reading verse 6 to verse 11 in Acts chapter 1. So when they met together, the disciples, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up intently. They were looking up intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now, I'd just let you to think for a moment, do you hate pains in the neck? I suspect you do, and if you do, you and God have something in common. In verse 10, we see Jesus' disciples looking intently up into the sky. They're disappointed that Jesus chose not to stay, and so they stand there waiting for Jesus to come back. God sees this and sends two angels to them with a message. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Now Jesus' disciples would have got very sore neck if they spent the rest of their lives looking up into the sky, waiting for Jesus to return. And though the angels reinforce the fact that Jesus will return, God doesn't want them or us to spend the rest of our lives like this. I've lost my place now. <laughs> instead, instead of looking up all the time, we are to have both a vertical and horizontal focus. Vertically, looking up, remembering that Jesus will return. And horizontally, horizontally looking out at people in need of the hope that Jesus brings. Now, you might say, nobody is interested in the hope that Jesus offers. I don't doubt that that is true in some cases, maybe a lot of cases. But let's not say people's no for them. Let's not forget the reality that the, panic dam that the pandemic has underlined. People are desperately seeking hope. And many are open to considering just where this hope might be found. And when Jesus' disciples at the top of the Mount of Olives stopped looking up, they'd have looked out and seen Jerusalem and the outskirts of Judea, places Jesus has spoken to them about in his last words. The disciples gathering around Jesus and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' followers were looking up, 
They were looking up, wanting Jesus to bring about the hope of the Old Testament called the Kingdom of God. Jesus called them to look out, seeing all the people who had not yet heard about the hope that Jesus can bring. Why? Why this horizontal focus? Because Jesus wants us, believers, to spend our time between now and his return, inviting people to discover the hope that faith in Jesus brings. As he said in the very first paragraph in which he talked about his return, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now I suspect that this news, news about the importance of outreach to others, I suspect that if you're a Christian, this is not new news to you. If you've been a Christian like me for some time, you might know this already. It's just the practical going about it that we find difficult. So to help with this, North Shields We, North Shields Evangelical Church, plan in February to have a Saturday morning using some resources produced by A Passion for Life. We'll watch some videos and spend some time in discussion and prayer attempting to equip ourselves, motivate ourselves, and challenge ourselves to have this horizontal concern for other people, those who haven't heard about Jesus yet. In addition to this, in the coming year, we'll be doing something different each month on a month in, in an effort to engage with people in our community in North Shields, including your family and friends. So that is something we're gonna do as a church to help have this horizontal purpose, purpose to reach out to others with the name of Jesus Christ. But to do all this, we need your participation. Participation, and that's what we see. The importance of participation in verse is 12 to 26, which I'll now read. Then they, the disciples, were turned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They, the eleven, all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about a hundred and twenty, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Jesus brought a, bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field, in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barabbas, Barsabbas, sorry, also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Now, I am very grateful for, to the preacher, Kevin de Young for helping me understand the importance of this otherwise strange event. Basically, the eleven disciples 
are choosing to replace Judas to bring the numbering up to 12 and they select two potential candidates for the job Joseph and Matthias two people who had both spent three years listening to Jesus teaching and they both witnessed Jesus death and resurrection they both met the selection criteria so I ask why not choose them both I mean, if you'd been given the task of sharing the gospel with the whole world, wouldn't having two extra pair of hands be a good idea? And why does Luke, the author of Acts, give us the origin story of Matthias, taking up half of his first chapter, only for Matthias to disappear into obscurity and never be heard about again? Acts never mentions this Matthias again. Nobody knows if he had a great impact on the spread of the gospel, or none at all. Well, if you read through these verses again, you'll see the focus on the number 12. In verse 13, we have the names of the 11 remaining apostles. In verse 17, Peter reminds them of what happened to apostle number 12. In verse 20, Peter reminds the group that it's God's will that number 12 be replaced. And in verse 21, Peter states clearly that only one replacement should be chosen. So in verse 26, we have the maths, 11 apostles plus 1 equals 12. 12, 12 was as, was as significant a number to the Jews as 007 is to us. When you hear the number 007, you instantly think of the person the Queen has commissioned to save the world, James Bond. 12 was the equivalent of 007 in the Old Testament, for it was the 12 tribes of Israel who God gave the mission of sharing hope with the world. God said to Abraham in the very first book of the Bible, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In other words, through Abraham's family, the 12 tribes of Israel, all people on earth would be blessed. For this reason, the 12 tribes of Israel were to pray like this. Psalm 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways, God's ways, may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. God wanted the 12 tribes of Israel to participate on a 007 mission, bringing God's blessing to the world, telling others about him and sharing the hope that he had given them. Jesus took, chose 12 disciples to remind them that they shared the same mission, to share God's blessing with the world through telling people about him. Now this might fascinate you a lot or not at all, but whatever you do, don't miss the main point. The work God began in the Old Testament is to be continued. The work that Jesus began to do in the Gospels is to be continued. And Jesus, not me or you, Jesus has chosen who's going to continue this work. You and me. From the twelve apostles came the church, the body of people that believe in Jesus and have the teaching contained within this book. And, though it, and it is through the church that the work of Jesus is to be continued. Telling people about Jesus' resurrection. Telling people about the promise of eternal life. Telling the guilt-ridden that they can be forgiven. Drawing alongside people and showing them, them the compassion of God in tangible ways. Now, your involvement in making this happen might be different from somebody else's, you might be the only Christian somebody knows who helps erode some of their prejudices. You might be someone who prays with dedication for the work of the church in North Shields and in the world. 
you might be the one who invites someone to one of the events that we'll be putting on as a church in the coming months. You might never give a gospel presentation, but you might, quoting somebody else. You might be somebody who talks about natural things spiritually and spiritually things naturally. People realise through what you say the, that the way you view the world is different it's different because it, because it is shaped by your Christian beliefs. Talking about natural things spiritually. And you might explain how your faith impacts you with honesty and honesty and simplicity. Talking about spiritual things naturally. Jesus wants us all to anticipate that he will work through us. Jesus wants us all to invite people to put their hope in him. Jesus wants us all to participate in this mission in whatever way we can.